Order. The Right Honourable Winston Peters. Uh, Mr Speaker. Order, order. Before the, before the member starts, um, I think there were 17 occasions during the Prime Minister's speech where, notwithstanding a warning, Mr Brownlee interjected. He is to cease and not interject at all during the speech. The right Honourable Winston Peters. A point of order, the Right Honourable, sorry, the Honourable Jerry Browning. I think it would be useful, sir, if you explain to the House what standing order you're calling on to stop a member speaking in this House. Order. I referred the member earlier and, and the, to, the, to the Speaker's ruling. I'm referring the member to the Speaker's ruling 1254. It is a long standing one. It has been enforced by speakers in the House before. It might have been a long time since the member has been in opposition, but he should know it. And I did warn senior members on the government side of its existence earlier. I will have no further discussion of this. The Right Honourable Winston Peters. Mr Speaker, this is about a budget building foundations. It's fact, not fiction. Real, not fake news, like someone I've just seen going. <laughs> Mr Speaker, a little over six months ago, we made a decision to go with the Labour Party in a coalition government. And today's speech by Mr Robinson reinforces the reasons why we did. We congratulate Mr Robinson and Prime Minister Ardoon for today announcing our plans for a fairer, more prosperous future for all New Zealanders. Mr Grant Robinson's first budget will be remembered for the foundations announced today, investments to release our country's potential and stay in the job of restoring capacity across public services after nine long years of national's woeful neglect. Now I can say, Mr Robinson, as you're reading out that budget, the National Party clearly got a deluge of mail today because they all had their heads down the whole time, from start to finish. Because it must be painful to have to admit that they were so derelict in their duty of running a balanced, fair economy. It's a budget that reflects the significant priorities of the Labour Party, the New Zealand First Party, and indeed the priorities of the Green Party as well. It's a budget that reflects the unique makeup of the first truly MMP government. And I say that because I was in an MMP government once, in fact the first one, where they did their best to derail the party that put them there in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I remember very well. And I remember some of the characters sitting over there now. Guilty as anything, still at the grindstone behind Simon, sharpening up their knives, waiting for the next takeover merchant. It's a truly MMP budget. It responds to the concerns expressed at the last September election. So it's a, a budget supported, and I'm saying this to my colleagues in the media, by the vast majority of New Zealand voters. New Zealand First, as you know, has been committed and constructive partner, as we said we would be, uh, during the last six months. And we've, built, we've set out, all of us, to make a positive difference to the lives, and the budget of this country in 2018 demonstrates that. It's for changing direction. It's not for a modified status quo, and it's not for thinking you can tweak and somehow get by with trickle down. Now, the um, Prime Minister, uh, the opposition leader rather, should know that. And uh, I want to say how clear it was and how pleasing it was to hear a budget that actually explained things uh, and, and with the simplicity of language. Now, the mantra of the National Party in this campaign for this budget is going to be making the claim that New Zealand is awash with money. Who said that's right? <laughs> oh, one of them did. Uh, the rest are not better put their hand up. Who said that's right? New Zealand's are washed with money. Chris Bishop. That's why he's number 37 in their caucus. <laughs> Mr Bishop, you're not going to get a promotion. I know you've got more brains than that. But you're not going to get more than 37 in your caucus if you talk and think like that. Can I just say, it was clear as daylight that the National Party had been hiding the costing. $20 billion, for example, when it comes to the Defence Force, was a fiscal risk it wasn't even budgeted for. 
And then he had a frigate was overrun and costing by 148 million. And they kept it quiet from the public from July last year all the way to election day. Then the shocking run down of the health sector, referred to by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, with a woeful neglect of Middlemore Hospital. Merely the most obvious symbol of neglect, underinvestment, and you know, such perfidy defines the National Party's last nine years. As for mycoplasma bovis outbreak, well, that happened three months before the last election. And what did they do? Well, nothing. And every day, this man, Nathan Guy, who was responsible for it, responsible for doing nothing about border security, there weren't 150 border security breaches, there were 173 in their watch. And he has the frontery, which probably tells me that too much of something from the cow's tail got on his ear when he was farming. He thinks he can come down here and everybody will forget that he was the man with the DNA, the fingerprint, the thumbprint, and blood all over it. He is the man responsible, but no, no, not him. He's so arrogant, he thinks he can come back to this house every day and starts charging the new minister, a decent minister of, of agriculture, a decent minister of agriculture, a decent minister of agriculture. He thinks he can attack him. Amazing. And can I just tell you, you know, National's grandiose transport plans, none of them were in the NZTA funding. Yeah, the superhighway from Whangarei to Walkworth, not one cent was in the NZTA funding. But not these people. They go around, they think they can flim flam some country folk by saying it wasn't for us, we'd have a superhighway. <laughs> now, my friend Mr. Twyford knows that that is, to use our agricultural term, bulldust. <laughs> no money for the Dunedin Hospital? No, it's going to be a public private partnership. Who was the private entity? They didn't know. But they said anyway. Fong Ray Boys High School, 62 million. Uh, the voters asked, how are you going to pay for it? They said, a public-private partnership. Now, what is this, a bank? No, it's something of fiction that's nothing until you establish it. So they never had any money for it. No, they didn't. No money for more police, for the surge in prison numbers, for the multi-billion dollar infrastructure deficit and billions of dollars in the fiscal hole for education. They weren't awash with money. They just weren't responsible. They thought they could disguise it. Now, you know, National was a marketing operation based upon spin and not much else. Where is John Key? Anybody up there know? Where's Mr. King? Mr. Spray and walk away. Where's Bill English? Where is Stephen Joyce? Where's Jonathan Coleman? They, oh, big fun. Oh, Myrtle Russ knows. <laughs> order, order. The experts on weeds knows then. The expert on weeds knows. Where's Jonathan Coleman? Well, they all packed it in because once National's marketing flim flam collapsed, so did their commitment. Once National's flim flam had collapsed, so did their commitment. Stephen Joyce's final act. His 11.6 billion fiscal hole was born out of a deep sense of cynicism and people saw through it. Somebody over there, I think it was Nick English. Is it Nick English? Order. Nick Smith. He got there because of Bill English. But Nick Smith said he was right. He says Stephen Joyce's 11.6 billion fiscal hole was right. You know, Mr. Order. Smith, Mr. Smith, if I was as tired as you, I'd give up and go home. <laughs> I really would. I'd quit. I'd find a new career before it's too late. Before it's too late. Sitting there every day shouting out, answer the question, is so tiresome, it's so bald, it's so agistic that it probably befills you, but the member should be very worried about his future. He's only there on sufferance. Or he says, at least I won my seat. <laughs> Look, actually, I can, I can't, one of my great shames is, I went down to Richmond way back in 1990 and I packed the place out for 600 people to campaign for him. And I had to explain, because you're so young, that Pitt the Younger was 24 when he became the Prime Minister of England. But I didn't, say, I didn't forgot to say that the candidate we had for the time, National Party at the time, named Nick Smith, was still in nappies. 
and I feel sorry when I did that because I owe a, a big apology to the people of this country. And worse is National's descent into fake news, where they pretend to pour resources into areas of need where they did not, or perniciously making stuff up, up about the government's plans, it's clear we've reached a new low in our politics. Mr Stephen Joyce had a Damascus moment of voluntary admission of how short National's budgetary plans were. That can be the only reason why he came up with $11.6 billion, because they weren't spending it. Whatever the cause, the key English government's legacy will be their underfunded and underdelivered promises and chronic underperformance. Now it's down to fake news. Now it's down to fake news and fake announcements. We've reached a new low in politics. I remember Holland, not personally, of course, <laughs> Holyoke, personally, of course, and Muldoon. And you know what? Against them, against these guys, those men had honour. Mr Bridges does not. And as Michael Bloomberg recently warned, and I'll quote him, Order. the only thing more dangerous than dishonest politicians who have no respect for the law is a chorus of enablers who defend their every lie. There are plenty that I see today. And Bloomberg went on to say, the greatest threat to democracy isn't communism, jihadism, or any other external force or foreign power. It's our own willingness to tolerate dishonesty in service of party and in pursuit of power. And in pursuit of power. He could have written that about the National Party because that's exactly what we heard today. National's temporary leader for Tauranga and for the uh, National Party leadership would do well to heed these words. He'll not make any headway until he cuts out the faux, power, the faux ray outrage and fake news and offers a mayor copper for the, performance, the poor performance of him and his predecessors. Take, for example, over the period of the last government's trade declined as a percentage of GNI from 30% to 27. And they were promising they were building trade and it fell by from 30 to 27%. And what does the National Party leader say in response to the budget for foreign affairs and trade so critically needed? He says, we've got our priorities wrong. So what would his priorities be about making wealth? Offshore, he had none. They got rid of 100 top line trade and dipl diplomatic specialists offshore. A hundred. And there Mr Smith sits there with all that propped up taxpayer support for all his useless years in this parliament and he laughs and smiles as though that's a good outcome. Mr Bridges' speech today, Mr Bridges' speech today reinforces why he is failing. No vision, no plan, no ideas, just carping and whining. It was poorly delivered should have been touched up by a speech uh, therapist. <laughs> As to the pronunciation, by a desperate pretender, the last man to believe in trickle-down economics, which even the Fred Astaire of the South Pacific, the member for Epsom, calls an imaginary friend, is sliding into insignificance. No wonder Mr Bridges is showing early signs of relevance deprivation syndrome. <laughs> and it's a safe prediction that it'll only get worse for him because many voters, many more voters, dislike his leadership as those who merely tolerate him. The voters see, you see, there's no leader, he offers no vision, and that his sole achievement to date is to rip apart the previous bipartisan approach of this country as a hallmark of our politics when it came to foreign policy. It was always above politics, but not this fellow. So desperate, he attacks the very issue that he himself created. Huge disparity. He may believe, as he said last week, that it's a waste of money trying to compete with others in the Pacific, but our partners in the region and those outside it disagree with him. Hopelessness and resignation is Mr Bridges' raison d'etre. But it's not mine, it's not my colleagues, and it's not our country's partners who want to work with New Zealand to make our difference in our own backyard to our economic security. And indeed, our personal security. New Zealanders look for a government which offers fresh direction, for a government which offers energy and drive, and dare I say it, Mr Smith, youth. <laughs> and look for leaders 
who offer stability. They look for leaders who offer substance. And Budget 18 demonstrates the Coalition Government is delivering on these expectations. The speech by the Leader of the Opposition exposes the dismal state of leadership of the National Party. They were so bad they had a leadership contest and not one of them was rating 1%. Not one was rating 1% before they ran for the, in the leadership contest. Not one of them. So it shows how desperate they are. It was a speech devoid of ideas, riddled with cliches, and speeches, speeches like that is why they created the word vacuous. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you, Sunshine, I'm here. I'm here after all these years because we know how to get a poll up. But not that failure. Not that member there. He's, he was a minister for three months. Back to the back bench, he'll never be back, back, back again. <laughs> Speeches like that was the reason why they invented the word vacuous. And here's what the voting public has concluded about the leader of the National Party. What you see is what you get. And what you get is Mr. Simon Slickbridges, oh, yeah. Mr. Simon Soundbite Bridges, Mr. Simon One Way Bridges, <laughs> and yes, Mr. Simon Short Term Bridges. <laughs> Budget 18 showcases the New Zealand First and other parties who are the heart of this government. We're making a positive difference to voters across our portfolios, though making, through making better investment choices, achieving better policy outcomes and by restoring lost capacity in areas where it's desperately needed. I leave shortly for Japan in the next couple of hours. Why? Because we need to beef up our trading relationship, and indeed every relationship we've got in the Pacific, and next week we'll be off to China. Again, unlike that group there, we're out to grow our exports so the money comes back to the fan in New Zealand and we can finance good economic policy and good social policy. And I'll even finance a mouth guard if I can afford to spare to bring back for Mr. Smith. In recent economic development, we've got the Provincial Growth Fund. We're planting a billion trees. We've got a port study because we're going to connect up our port value and our port assets in this country and our transport assets. We've got a new forestry service starting in regional New Zealand. And uh, we've got, for example, the things that also matter in defence, a substantial boost in a critical area, which means that our defence capacity in the Pacific, so desperately needed by so many Pacific Islands and by the Pacific itself, can now show up responsibly. Yeah. We're going to see, of course, a new 1800 frontline police. Yeah. But it doesn't stop there. My colleague, the Minister for... No, no, now I want to tell Mr Bishop, my colleague, the Minister of Police, ensured that it didn't stop there. There's also 480 backup office staff. Yeah, 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 yes, exactly. Tell me, what, what, was, what was that member's party's record? De declining numbers against, against population. Mr. Mr Nash has come around. It's a dramatic turnaround. And I expect that to be the last stupid question I hear from number, seven, from number 37 in the National Party Caucus. <laughs> will it be Oraki Tomariki? Or will it be health funding? Desperate health, desperate, desperate health board so much in debt being attended to? Or doctor's visits for under 14s? This is a change in the outcomes so desperately needed by this country. And in foreign affairs, what we released last week, where we're going in that respect. But you know, I've got to say this to my colleagues and the Prime Minister, we should have got more. <laughs> if you realise the problems that we face out there and how we've, they've been subject to such long neglect, we should have got more, but we're not dissatisfied or unhumble about it. But I hope <laughs> the next, in the next few budgets we'll do better. The reality is, you see, we inherited a portfolio where our bilateral aid, our multilateral aid rather, had fallen to the lowest in the OECD. In all those countries in the lowest in the OECD, look at the chart, and there's New Zealand at the very bottom. Well, we're going to turn that around because in the end we believe in international rules, sound government, and international protocols. And a small country like that, like ours, desperately need that to be promoted, and we've got to spend money getting ourselves into that right frame of influence. As for racing, well, we're going to turn racing around, and we're doing it so dramatically with some wise policies. But in the conclusion, Mr. Speaker, can I just say this? Uh, 
we're going to make New Zealand great again. We're going to make we're going to make a great economy. We're going to make that economy great for the regions. We're going to make sure that it'll be great for young New Zealanders to gain employment. We're going to make sure it's going to be great for exports, but that the money is shared at the end by everyone. For nine long years, for nine long years, the old truths about businessmen and women being the backbone of the country and the regions being the fertile and broad countryside support for their big cities were forgotten by national. And so the Labour New Zealand First Coalition Government, supported by the Greens, has taken its first steps to effect a transformation in our economy and prospects. The adaptive work will take longer than one budget, but today a strong foundation has been laid. You know, we know there's much more work to do, and we look forward to fulfilling and continuing our role as a constructive force in the coalition to achieve positive change for our supporters and indeed for all New Zealanders. And uh, for those National Party supporters so despairing of the, op of the opposition, my words to them, hang on, because help's still on its way. <laughs> The Honourable James Shaw.